All right, here we are, the Bible in seven passages. This is lesson number five. We're going to be discussing passage number five today, John chapter three, verses 14 to 16. The title of this lesson, The Promise Revealed. So uh, to review a little bit of what we've done so far, our Bible study is situated in a future time where all the dreams of technology have been realized, driverless, transportation, uh, personalized on-demand delivery of everything from food and clothing to furniture and personal services, including entertainment and education, even medical attention, brought to your door by contacting the Universal Services link for your sector and placing your request for products and services. Uh, in a future time, everything you need and everything you want in every imaginable version available for delivery uh, to where you are. For example, you feel like Italian food, Universal Services will send a team to set the table and to prepare a delicious Italian menu and mood in your own home. Uh, need a, a blood test? Need an MRI? Universal services in the future will send their mobile lab and x-ray unit to take care of your medical needs anywhere that is convenient for you. Would like to have a, maybe a vacation in Greece? Universal services will book your flight, process your security requirements, send the shuttle to pick you up and deliver you to the plane's entry door. No waiting in line, no checkpoints, no stress about being late. You can even have uh, universal services, uh, bag packing service, pack your bags and deliver them to your vacation spot for you. So as I mentioned in the first lesson of this series, this society of the future has succeeded in integrating the government, major media and technology companies with universities and the military to create a unified system to gather and manage and store and disseminate information of all kinds. This gathering and centralizing of information has led to breakthroughs in developing, protecting and producing all kinds of advances in food production, transportation, engineering, manufacturing, new and exciting products and services. However, there has been one ominous development, especially for Christians in this future world that we're talking about. The centralization of information and the control of what ideas and books are stored and transferred from the quantum memory storage units, which are responsible for archiving and distributing all digital information created and exchanged in society, that system, that centralized information bank, no longer contains or distributes any material concerning the Bible. This means that since the Bible was judged to be harmful to society because it contained hate literature, for example, forbidding certain types of sexual activity forbidding certain types of sexual activity considered hate literature now, and uh, Christianity uh, uh, promoted divisiveness. For example, it taught that non-believers would not go to heaven. I mean, the inclusion committee categorized it as subversive propaganda and removed it from the list of approved communication. And so the end result of this action has been the systematic removal of the Bible from all libraries and bookstores and schools and homes. All material, whether in hard copies or digital versions of not only the Bible, but books and other types of printed material about the Bible have slowly but surely been gathered and eliminated. In this future time and place, the Bible and all related works are being purged to the point where even Christians, several decades after this law came into being, have little to no access to a complete Bible, let alone commentaries or other study aids that are used along with the scriptures. And so I ask the question, how would believers maintain their faith 
in a world where there is no Bible. One method I suggested would be to select certain key passages that would summarize the core message originally laid out in the Bible, in the 66 individual books of the Bible, uh, to pick out certain core passages uh, that would uh, condense the information uh, of the Bible into these core passages. This is the idea behind the series entitled The Bible in Seven Passages. So far, we've examined the first four of these seven, four passages from the Old Testament, four passages that hopefully uh, uh, summarize the information uh, that God wanted to give to mankind through His word. The four passages we've looked at so far, four of the seven, the first of which is Genesis chapter one, verse one. This we call the prelude to the promise. It deals with creation. This passage reveals how the world was created and by whom. Second passage, Genesis 3 verse 1 to verse 24. This is God's promise to fallen man. In this passage, we said this passage explained the reason for the fallen nature of man and the creation as well as God's solution to man's condition, and that would be the promise of a savior. So the first passage we looked at tells us where does everything come from? The second passage we looked at uh, explains how everything got to be the way it was and what God decided to do to fix it. The third passage, Genesis 11, 27 to 12, 7, we call the person of the promise historical. In this passage, we're introduced to Abram, who later became Abraham, the person that God chose to form a nation through whom the promised savior who would fulfill God's promise to sinful man would eventually come. This passage gives us the historical physical link from the Old Testament portion of the Bible to the new concerning who would come to do God's will in saving mankind. And then the fourth passage we looked at was Isaiah chapter 53 verses 1 to 12. Here the person of promise, not historical, but the person of promise spiritual. This passage describes the spiritual nature of the person sent by God to fulfill His promise to the Jews and through them to all the world. And so in today's lesson, we're going to study passage number five in the series, this time from the New Testament, John chapter three, verses 14 to 16, where Jesus clearly reveals the details of the promise. The details of the promise. So here, the promise is revealed. Now, in order to understand the New Testament in its proper context, you have to see it as follows. A little preview work here. The Gospels, these are four eyewitness records of the Old Testament prophecies being fulfilled by and through Jesus and His ministry. The book of Acts uh, is an account of the establishment of the church from various eyewitnesses, uh, eyewitness sources recorded by Luke, a Gentile convert to Christianity and an associate of Paul the Apostle. Then we have the epistles letters by various apostles and disciples of apostles containing teaching and instruction, admonition and encouragement sent to different churches and individuals. And finally, the book of Revelation, a record of the apostle John's visions concerning the church and its battle with satanic forces on earth and in the spiritual realm, which it wins in the end. And so in passage number five, John chapter three, verses 14 to 16, we have Jesus, the promised one, brought forth by the Jewish nation, summarizing in a single passage the content and the completion of God's original promise to Adam and Eve, his covenant with Abraham and his descendants, and the fulfillment of prophecy concerning the mission of the promised one. All of this, in one passage. All of these things are contained 
in what some refer to as the golden verse of the Bible. Now, Jesus is speaking in, the, in context here of John 3, 14 to 16. Um, Jesus is speaking to a, a man called Nicodemus. He was a Pharisee. A Pharisee was a lawyer uh, uh, who belonged to a particular group called the Pharisees. The word uh, meant separated ones. Um, he was a Pharisee who sought out Jesus by night in secret for fear of the other Pharisees in order to ask him questions concerning salvation, concerning the promise. Nicodemus believed, but his faith was weak. Jesus explains that salvation, he explains to Nicodemus that salvation required water and spirit. Jesus refers to salvation in two ways. Uh, he refers to it as being born again, a new birth, and he also uh, refers to it as entry into the kingdom of God. Different ways of referring to the same thing. Now Nicodemus doesn't quite understand thinking that born again refers to human birth. And so that's where we're going to pick up our, uh, our uh, passage here. Uh, in John 3 it says, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? And so uh, Jesus then frames the idea of salvation in a way that Nicodemus, a Jewish Pharisee, could understand. So now let's read John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in Him have eternal life. And so Jesus refers to an incident that occurred while the Jews were wandering in the desert. After they had been freed from Egyptian captivity, they wandered in the desert for 40 years. And Jesus is referring to an incident that took place there in the desert and not some obscure incident, something that all Jews, uh, some incident that uh, all Jews, especially a Pharisee, would be familiar with. This, um, this incident is recorded in uh, the book of Numbers, and I'll read that for you. It says, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and you intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded uh, for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard and it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a standard and it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. So with this incident, uh, again, as I mentioned, familiar to all Jews, Jesus is teaching Nicodemus the basics of the gospel using an incident from Jewish history. The people bitten by fiery snakes died, just like those guilty of sin also died. And so Nicodemus would understand the parallel here. The cure for the snake bite, however, was not the offering of an animal sacrifice, but the obedience of faith. If they believed what Moses said, and what did Moses say? Well, he said, those who looked at the bronze serpent attached to a standard or a pole, those who looked at that bronze serpent after having been bitten would be healed. And if they obeyed based on that faith, they too would be healed. And so Jesus establishes the idea from a passage in the Hebrew scriptures that Nicodemus could relate to. And that idea was that salvation is obtained or received on the basis of faith. The faith that produces the obedience which leads to the salvation. Jesus then goes forward one more step, if you wish, to explain and to declare how this system of faith is related to him, to him, to Jesus. This is where we get to John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 
And so this passage connects back to the uh, four Old Testament scriptures that we have studied by giving a name and a mission and the motivation for the promise made to Adam and Eve, which was passed forward by Abraham, which was carried throughout history by the Jewish people, which was spoken of by the prophets, and now which is being fulfilled by Jesus Christ Himself. So let's break the passage down and unpack all the information it provides in one short verse, John 3, 16. So it begins with God. Well, this is the who. The promise in the end comes from God. We read in Genesis 1, verse 1, that God is the one who created the heavens and the earth. We read in Genesis 3, 1 to 24, that God is the one who promised to send someone to defeat Satan. We read in Genesis 11, 27 to 12, 7, that God is the one who spoke and made a promise to Abraham. We read in Isaiah chapter 53, verses one to seven, that God is the one who spoke through the prophets concerning the Savior. And now, through Jesus, we see that God, the Father, is again the one who will complete the plan to save mankind. We go on, so loved the world. This section goes to motivation. Why did God do this? Why did God do this? Well, His love, His agape love, was and is His motivation. Even though mankind had fallen away into sin, God remained the same, because God is love, right? First John 4, verse 8. And love is his great motivation. Everyone has sinned and will be condemned for it. But God's love for us is what motivates his plan to save sinners from their sins. You know, the word so, so loved, explains that the love required to achieve this end was such that only God could possess and express such love. It was beyond man's capability. The next part of the passage, that he gave his only begotten son. This explains the extent of God's love. The depth of his love is measured by the value of what he gave in order to secure our salvation. He gave his one of a kind, that's what only begotten means. He gave his, own, uh, his one of a kind son. There's only one like him, all right? He's not one of many. He's not the first one that, that, was, you know, that was sent. He's one of a kind. Jesus, the second person in the Godhead, became a man to carry out the Father's plan. The Father gave Jesus up to the indignities of human suffering and death, as well as the pain of separation from Himself in order to remove the guilt and condemnation man was due to suffer because of their sins. No living being would ever, could ever pay such a price for love. We continue, whoever believes in Him shall not perish. The secret of the promise is revealed here. Since Adam and Eve, we knew that it was sin that led to destruction and death. Here, Jesus reveals that it is faith in the promised one sent by God that will save mankind from this death and this destruction. Abraham and the Jewish nation, as well as the prophets, they knew that the promised one was coming and bringing salvation. But Jesus finally revealed the who, Jesus himself, and the how, faith, of salvation. And then he says, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So Jesus not only reveals the who and the how, but also the what of salvation. Resurrection and eternal life experienced by every single believer. That's the what of salvation. Peter the apostle said that no one knew the details of God's promise, not even the angels knew. First Peter chapter 1 verse 13. 
And so Jesus clearly reveals the sum of all the prophecies and symbolism of Jewish temple worship in one succinct passage that reveals the entire plan of God to save sinful man. It's worth looking at its entirety once more. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. In this one passage, we have the details of the fulfillment of the promise made all the way back. This passage here ties all the way back to Adam and Eve. They received the promise. Abraham and the Jews brought the promise forward. The prophets spoke of the promise to come. Jesus comes and reveals that He is the promised one. And this here, salvation of all men through faith in Himself, this will be the method of that salvation. All right, a short lesson for this time because we have some longer things to do next time. We're going to look at passage number six, which sets forth Satan's second biggest lie. Very important, uh, certainly uh, dealing with uh, modern society today. Even to this day, we still have to deal with Satan's second biggest lie. So be with us for uh, passage number six when we tackle that. Thank you very much for your attention.